Uh, good morning, everybody. So, um, yeah, I think we can we can start uh, slowly, and then if there is somebody else uh, joining, um, uh, I guess they will join during the the talk. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, uh, today uh, we have a talk by uh, Gemma de las Cuevas. She's a uh, a good old friend <laughs> and an assistant professor at the Institute for Theoretical Physics of the University of Innsbruck, um, which is uh, one of the top institutes actually working on quantum science and, and other related topics, as probably you already know. And uh, she's going to be explaining us today about a very intriguing uh, topic, which is called From Simplicity to Universality and Undecidability. So I'm pretty sure that there are going to be many questions, Gemma, because we like to ask a lot. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you for for giving us this seminar and all yours. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> thanks a lot for having me, Roman, and um, indeed, uh, good old friends. Uh, <laughs> and I'm very glad to be sharing now this with you. I'm very intrigued by your work, and I want to, uh, as you that you shared with us uh, the other day about uh, seeing language or like the merge as an RG step. And as you will see, I'm also trying, or we're also trying to get closer to language, but from a different perspective. <laughs> Um, I will mainly be talking about formal languages today, which I see as, a, as an intermediate step toward um, natural languages, which are, I find are much harder. And uh, indeed, I'm in an institute which where lots of quantum expertise, but all what I will tell you today about is non-quantum. And that's another big open question. Uh, what happens if we lift many of these ideas to the quantum world? All right, uh, but in fact, uh, and please ask as much as you like. Um, but in fact, um, I'd like to phrase it in, a, in much broader terms, namely as a journey from simplicity to universality and undecidability. And to this end, I'd like to start with a, an idea or an observation that simple rules can generate lots of complexity. Uh, you're probably used to this fact um, in your everyday lives. But I'd like to give you a few formal examples of this. First one are cellular automata. Um, this is like a little game where we have um, cells of two possible colors, black and white. And then we have a few update rules um, that specify, for example, that if three consecutive cells are black then the lower cell becomes white, they're black, black, white, it gets white, black, white, black, it gets white, black, white, white, becomes black, and so on for the other four rules. In addition, so this looks fairly, I don't know what to call it, simple, I guess, or it's hard to tell whether it's simple or it's not, but it looks fairly innocent. Let's say we only have two colors and these are big rules. We also start with a simple initial configuration, namely these, um, we have a grid of where all cells are white, except for this middle cell, which is black. And we now look at the first row and apply these rules here on the left in order to obtain the black-white configuration of the second row, and then do it again to obtain the black-white configuration of the third row and so on for 20 steps. Okay, so the black sort of spreads in this kind of triangle, but it's unclear what's going on in the middle. So we can run the simulation now for 200 steps. And you can perhaps see that on the left, we have some periodic structures like here, but on the right, well, that <laughs> seems to be very complicated. Well, it is in fact complicated. Um, well, it's as close to a random number as you get in classical physics. So like um, uh, kind of a, a row, from, from this simulation is used as a pseudo random number generator in Mathematica. Um, there are many more examples in this book by Stephen Wolfram. Um, this is just like the tip of the iceberg. And so the message again is that the simple looking rules here together with that very simple initial configuration is capable of generating a lot of complexity. 
spin models, <clears throat> we find a similar story in physics. So spin models in their, in their simplest form are like a little game that, theory, that physicists or people who want to understand complex systems can play where they have, uh, we have a variable which can take two uh, possible states. That's like an, uh, an arrow pointing upwards or downwards or like our previous black and white. And then we have some rules which are dictated by the, by the physics. Like if you have two neighboring variables in the same state that costs little energy. If they are in different states that leads to more disorder. So there will be a competition between minimizing the energy and maximizing the disorder. And if you put these variables on the 2D square lattice, then whether minimizing the energy or maximizing the disorder wins will be determined by the temperature of the system. Okay, that will be a phase transition. Um, all of these details are in fact not important. My point is that this spin model, this, this little like toy model is simple in the sense that there are only two possible states the energy only depends on the on the states of, of the neighboring spins it's put on a, two, on, a, on a grid and so on now the main message is that this simple spin model is in fact very expressive again it because it can simulate for a precise notion of simulation all other spin models so things that looked much more complicated like models with high dimensional spins or where the interactions depend on four spins or more than four, or where they when they are placed on a grid on a three-dimensional grid or some higher dimensional graph. So we again find that what appeared to be simple is in fact as expressive as it gets. So it can explore the whole complexity of the world of spin models. The best understood example and most famous one is by sure that of Turing machines. Turing machines can run any possible algorithm if you believe in the church Turing thesis. Um, we're so used to this fact that we, I mean, we cannot, I, I still believe that the, the naive expectation is that more complicated algorithms should run on more complicated machines. I mean, that's the naive expectation. If you want to, if you want to compute a really complicated function, then you need to build a more complex machine, but this is not the case, right? The, the Turing machine will suffice to run any possible algorithm. And a similar result with some subtleties which are different holds for neural networks, like both restricted Boltzmann machines and, and fit forward neural networks can make similar statements. So um, architectures that look sim simple are as expressive as it gets, uh, or they can, be used to um, learn any function. So why, why, why is it the case that simple rules across so many examples and disciplines generate so much complexity? I believe that this is because they, so the systems jump to universality. So let me explain that. <clears throat> so imagine that we plot the complexity of the rules on the horizontal axis, so that like more complex rules belong to the, here, the right-hand side of the, um, of the plot and simpler ones to the left-hand side. And on the vertical axis, we plot or we represent how complex the system is, which is generated by these rules. So again, more complicated things would be on the upper side and simpler things on the lower side. Naively or intuitively, one expects some sort of proportionality relation. Like more complicated systems um, require more complicated underlying rules. But this is not what happens. What happens is that as the rules become gradually more complex and they suddenly undergo a very large change of functionality called the jump to universality, after which they can explore all complexity in their domain. And in this talk, I use universe, the word universal precisely um, with this meaning, as the capability of exploring all complexity in a given domain. And this puts these systems at the beginning of infinity, 
because they are in front of like an open-ended exploration of, of complexity, if you want. And this phrase is borrowed from this very inspiring book by David Deutsch. And some of the ideas uh, from this talk are also at least inspired by, by Deutsch's book. So the very first example we saw is the, the, the famous rule 110 from uh, cellular automata, which is known to be Turing complete. So um, it explores a very complicated landscape because it can simulate a universal Turing machine. Um, the second example we saw that of spin models, we also call them universal in the sense that they can simulate all other spin models. Turing machines are universal in the sense that they can run any algorithm. Neural networks are universal by this universal approximation theorem and variance thereof. And um, in fact, I believe that there are many more examples of, of like at least related phenomena on which I'm very unclear, but on which I'm very curious. Like perhaps some aspects of the complexity of, of biology, some aspects of them, I don't know exactly which, could benefit from this perspective on universality, and as well as some aspects of natural languages. Um, I can elaborate a little bit more on that. These are very thorny issues. Um, I know a little, I, we've thought more about this than about this, but in fact, in this talk, I would like to focus on the similarities between the universality notions in, in spin models, um, Turing machines, and neural networks. Here, I see a clear path um, of linking um, these universality notions. So our goal is to <clears throat> rigorously understand their relations so that we can go to the heart of the matter of universality and we can like export and import results because these things have been independently discovered. They often use um, different language, different notions of approximation, different wording because they come from different fields. So they are motivated by different questions. But I think that much is to be gained by, by linking and understanding what I believe is the same uh, phenomenon of universality across these fields. <clears throat> but before that, I want to ask why, why do the systems jump to universality? Why is our intuition wrong? And <clears throat> I don't understand this thoroughly yet but I have an intuition that I'd like to share with you regarding what is going on in these systems. I believe that the key is that a hierarchy becomes entangled. So it becomes like a tangled hierarchy. So imagine that here on this hierarchical level, we put them, we kind of draw the systems. So every point is like um, one system. And on the upper level, we plot the rules that give rise to this system. Now, the, the natural hierarchy, or the hierarchy is this one, kind of the rules determine the system. That's why they are the rules of the system. Setting aside the non-determinism things and so on. Kind of all the magic comes in when when these systems reach a certain level of um, expressiveness, they can suddenly be used to encode the rules. Now, this is amazing because suddenly the rules can be fed as input, the description of another rule. So one rule can simulate another rule. I think that this is where all the magic comes in. <clears throat> I think that's why simple rules are so powerful because you, they only need to be able to read the description of another rule, which is possible because of this upward arrow and behave like it. And at this point, universality is achieved. This is kind of the tangled hierarchy. And well, that sounds very abstract probably, 
and probably you don't fully understand this because I don't fully understand it myself. <laughs> We're trying to make this precise, but um, let me give you a tangled hierarchy that you've surely seen, the drawing hand by Escher. Here, this hand is in a higher hierarchical level than the calf, but the calf becomes alive. Um, and so in this sense, it kind of goes up a level. It kind of climbs the ladder here and going up. And then this thing is in a higher hierarchical level than the calf, which again kind of goes up a level. <clears throat> so this is a tangled hierarchy. And this word, um, by the way, this is called also a strange loop by Hofstadter. And um, in this very like fascinating book, Hofstadter makes the case that these tangled hierarchies appear in Escher's paintings, like this one, in Bach's music, in the structure of some of his compositions, which kind of talk about themselves at different like length scales somehow. And in Gödel's proof, in the proof of um, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, um, to which I will go in a second. Namely, one consequence of this tangled hierarchy perspective is that systems, <clears throat> because of this upward arrow, rules can suddenly do self-reference. They can be fed their own description. And that's very dangerous or like that's very close to, to creating a paradox, namely a paradox by self-reference and negation, like the liar paradox. If I say I'm a liar and you have to decide if I'm lying or I'm not, you will conclude that I'm lying if and only if I'm not lying. Um, all these undecidability statements, like Gödel's proof, Russell's paradox, the halting problem, and so on, they are all the liar paradox. Um, yeah, so this is um, undecidability, and the usual conclusion uh, out of this paradox is that one cannot decide whether that sentence is true or false. So it is undecidable. And so because of that, I see universality as the other side of the coin of undecidability. And in fact, um, I wrote an essay last year um, explaining kind of this perspective that I call it universality everywhere implies undecidability everywhere. Um, so universality everywhere is a principle that says that essentially every system can explore all complexity in its domain. So essentially every system is um, universal. But the other side of the coin is that essentially every question about the system is undecidable. Um, so the goal of this research program is to understand the reach of universality and undecidability across disciplines. And I'd like to do so by on the one hand, establishing rigorous links among universal spin models, universal Turing machines, universality notions and neural, neural networks, and then these are more tenuous, universality notions in natural languages and in biology. As I said, the root here is less clear. And to this end, we have started by trying to understand this link rigorously. So as a first step, we have described spin models as automata. And this is what I'd like to share with you during this talk. A second thing we're trying to do is to establish an overarching framework for universality. And um, I have the pleasure and the lack of working with some really interesting people like um, Sebastian Stengele and Tobias Reinhardt who are working on this project and we are doing some Think really nice progress. I'm very excited about that. Um, of putting this, like this notion, all these notions of universality into a comprehensive framework. But it's too early to, to talk about that. Okay, so in this talk, I will focus on this, which is interesting per se, as I see it and, and as I will try to show you. But to that end, um, let me give you an intuition as to. What, what these notions of universality have in common. In all of these cases, there are actual and auxiliary variables. 
So the universal object has auxiliary variables as well. And the auxiliary variables encode the description of the target model that the universal model is simulating. So <clears throat> for example, in physics, our object of study is a spin model. And this can be transformed into an instance of the universal model where we have some, and the black variables are like th those that are here. And there are lots of auxiliary variables which are depicted in gray. And the actual and the auxiliary variables are called physical and auxiliary spin. So the physical ones would be the black ones and the auxiliary ones, the gray ones. And the description of the model is in terms of the distribution of coupling strengths and magnetic fields of this auxiliary spin. So you have more degrees of freedom when you, when you make this transformation, you add degrees of freedom and you have to fix those degrees of freedom so that the universal model is the same, simulates actually, the target spin model. I mean, fixing these degrees of freedom amounts to fixing the description of the, of the target model. The same is the case in computer science. So we have an automaton, machine T, say. This is defined by a set of rules, finite set of transition rules. And for a given input, it outputs, it accepts or rejects. For the moment, I am ignoring issues about non-halting. This can be transformed into an instance of a universal Turing machine, if this is a Turing machine, which admits an enlarged input, namely X, as well as a description of T, so that you know what it has to simulate by some encoding D, and it will behave as T, it will simulate as T, uh, it will simulate T on X. So the output will be some encoded form of T of X. So the actual variables would be the input X and the auxiliary ones, the description of T. And the description of the original machine would be the part of the input describing T. And similarly for a neural network, which has to learn a function F, or for a function that is to be learned F, you can have some number of, in this case, they are called visible units, as well as many hidden units, um, whose parameters you can fix. So in this case, they are called weights and biases, so that um, this um, network with those values of the weights and biases is equal to, or is approximately equal to F is what it needs to simulate. Um, and in order to rigorously link these things, we have started with this link because we feel it, well, we come from this world and this is the best understood example. And more precisely, before translating universality, what we need to translate are these objects. So how does, in what sense is a spin model an automaton? That's the question that we need to address. And that's the question I'd like to focus on now um, by sharing with you this recent work um, with, um, uh, th there's a version, a very old version on the archive with David Drexel. There's a much more improved version with many more results with Sebastian, which we haven't put on the archive yet. And it, all, it also has a different title. And Tobias Reinhardt is also working on this but directly from the perspective of the grammar and for the easing model in a, and in a very thorough way. It couldn't be, anyway, I can, I can go into the details of the work by Tobias, but it's very cool as well. Okay, so what do we do? We take a classical spin Hamiltonian and we cast it as a formal language. A formal language is a set of strings where every string is a concatenation of symbols from a given alphabet, finite alphabet. The alphabet can be ABC or it can be zero one, for example, or it can consist of a single, well, it may be a little problematic if it consists of a single symbol. And then we classify this formal language in the Chomsky hierarchy of languages. So this is the natural complexity measure of formal languages. And this gives us a new complexity measure for classical spin models, 
which is different from the usual one, which is the computational complexity of the ground state energy problem. It has different easy to hard thresholds. It has different properties. Uh, we have compared this rigorously and it's just a new measure. So more precisely, a Hamiltonian is a map H, a Hamiltonian H is a map from a string, so a set that, that, that I would call a, sp a spin configuration, where each SI is an element of a finite alphabet, which are like the values of the classical spins, like 0, 1, or minus 1, 1, or up to Q levels, to a number, the energy, which we take to be integer, but now crucially for all n. It's very important that this map um, this is a family of maps, if you want, okay, for all system sizes. Now we define a formal language, LH, as the set of all pairs of this spin configuration, comma, the corresponding energy. So this, is, this should be H of S1 to Sn for all n. So this is called the graph of the function H. The graph of the function is the set of all pairs of in input output pairs of a function. And um, please note that there are infinitely many elements because it's for all n. And maybe you can already imagine that if the if h is more complicated, for example, it's a 2D model, then it will be like more complicated to come to calculate the energy from the spin configuration. So that will give rise to like a more complicated language. And if it's simpler, then it will be a simpler kind of language. For example, the 1D Ising model is the map from S1 to Sn to this sum. I'm assuming that, that the sum from i equals 1 to n minus 1 of Si times Si plus 1 for all n. I'm assuming that Si is plus minus 1 here. So this product is plus minus 1. And then this sum is a number from, I guess, plus n to minus n or something like that. And the language of the 1D Ising model is the set of all these pairs. Um, the configuration, for example, 1 minus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, comma, and then an energy, which we in fact express in unary. Anyway, that's, that's a detail. Then energy, which remember is an integer for all n. Okay, once this language is fixed, we prove a theorem that says, LH is deterministic context-free, for example. Okay, that is a, a classification in the Chomsky hierarchy of the language. So um, maybe let me emphasize that while, so the, the casting the spin model as a language is not unique, but once the language is fixed, the classification in the Chomsky hierarchy is unique. It, it's a theorem. I can elaborate on this point if you want. Okay. But now let me show you what we obtain. First of all, recall that a formal language L is a set of strings. And this is in correspondence with um, automata, with an automaton. Namely, given a string X, the automaton recognizes the language if it can tell whether X is in L. Um, so this is the Chomsky hierarchy of formal languages. Um, recursively enumerable is the more general class and there's context sensitive, context free. I am additionally here distinguishing um, between context free and deterministic context free, which cannot be distinguished at the level of the grammar, but for me it's important. And the smallest class is regular. Now, these things, these languages are recognized by Turing machines. And all these other languages are recognized by weaker types of automata. Particularly the context sensitive languages are recognized by linear bounded automata, which are like Turing machines with um, a linear amount of tape that they can use. Um, context free languages are recognized by Poisson automata. They are a model of computation where the head can only, it's like a Turing machine, but the head can only move, right? It cannot overwrite the tape, but it has access to a stack. The stack is like a cellar where it can put things, it's called push, and pop the things from the top. If it pushes an orange and an apple, then it pops an apple and then the orange. 
Um, these are recognized by a deterministic version of the Poisson automata and this by finite state automata. We find that 1D spin models for any notion of 1D, for any reasonable notion of 1D, for any notion of locality, like it can be K local, but as long as it is kind of 1D, okay, that it's like it's a very generous definition of 1D. Let me say, let me put it this way. For K level systems, for any, uh, excuse me, Q level systems, and for any for any Q, for any local symmetries, and so on, all of these things, all of these Hamiltonians H are such that their language LH is deterministic context free. 2D spin models or higher dimensional spin models, or in fact also all to all spin models, where every spin is connected to every other spin for all n, are context sensitive. Like their language is a context sensitive language. I think that's surprising. So we don't know how a spin model needs to be so that their language is recursively enumerable. So, so all these languages of LH can be recognized by automata that are weaker than a Turing machine. And um, <clears throat> well, zero D spin models are defined so that they are only defined on a finite set of states, N, so they are trivially regular because the language is finite. What's more interesting is that there's a subclass of 1D spin models which are like holographic because the energy only depends on finitely many spins on either end of the chain. And we call this effectively zero D spin model. And their language is also red. So in particular, note that Turing machines are universal, but the 2D Ising model with fields is a universal spin model. And they are at different levels here. So this is suggesting that these notions of universality are not the same. Um, that namely that this one is stronger than the one for spin models. And that's what we are gonna look at next. Like it's our next work. I cannot tell you about it yet, but that's, that's where we're at at the moment. For the Ising model, we find a different threshold between easy and hard, namely the ground state energy problem uh, is in P for the 1D and the 2D model and NP complete for the 3D Ising model. I'm talking about the Ising model without fields. As a language, it's easy if it's 1D, namely deterministic context free and hard if it is 2D or higher, so it's context sensitive. In fact, we are exploring very much this border here uh, namely, what's the minimal amount of like long range links that we need to add to the 1D Ising model so that um, it crosses kind of complexity levels in the Chomsky hierarchy. And um, another interesting thing is that the grammatical sentences of natural languages are mildly context sensitive. So when they are seen as spin models, these are um, models which are a little bit more connected than 1D, but less than 2D. I don't know if this can be linked to what Roman was telling us the other day about being at criticality. Perhaps it can. We don't exactly know what to do with that, but I find it very interesting. Okay, and this brings me to the topic of undecidability. Um, so I believe that undecidability is the statement that no system can thoroughly talk about itself. So to illustrate this claim, let me take for a system a set. And instead of talk, so talk means describe an attribute of this set. Now an attribute, say A, is a map from the set to zero one. So that if an element of the set does not have that property, it is mapped to zero. And if it does have that property or attribute, it is mapped to one. So that's a binary attribute. It suffices for our purposes. So you can identify the attribute with a um, set of elements from S, N, from S, say, whose image is one. For example, if S are the natural numbers, then the attribute A could be 
whether the number is odd, then 13579 would be mapped to one and 246810 would be mapped to zero. And you would be identifying the attribute being odd with a, subs with a set of odd numbers or being a prime or being a multiple of 50 million or being larger than a Googleplex or whatever. Now, this is um, an element of the power set of S. The power set of S is the set of all subsets. So one of these um, subsets will be precisely A. Okay. So for example, take um, a set with three elements, A, B, C, and the power set has eight elements. The empty set, the set with only one element, A, B, or C, A, B, B, C, A, C, A, B, C. And for example, the attribute being different from B is identified with um, A, C, like this, this, this element of the power set. Now, kind of a very deep statement is that a set can never be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with its power set. This is obvious for finite sets because they have different cardinality, right? So the, the cardinality of, of P of S is two to the cardinality of S. For example, here you have three and eight. There's, there cannot be one-to-one -one correspondence. But what's not obvious is that this is also true for infinite sets. And that's what Cantor proved. So it doesn't matter how super powerful the set is, its power set is gonna be more powerful. Or you will not be able to find a surjective map from S to P of S. Why not? Because if you assume that there is such a surjective map, you can build the liar paradox. You can build the element of self-reference communication, and that's not gonna be in the, map, in, the, in the image of the map, okay? So the liar paradox can never be captured from within the system. Now, what's our system? Remember, our system is S. S cannot fully capture its own power set because of the liar paradox. There is no surjective map from S to its power set. So S cannot talk about itself. S cannot reach all elements of its own power set. S cannot describe its own attributes no matter how powerful S is. Now, this is very powerful because it has many reincarnations. This sentence is false, a halting problem. You assume that there's an algorithm that solves the halting problem, feed it its own description and negate, or rather halt if and only if it doesn't halt, and then you obtain a machine that halts if and only if uh, it doesn't halt. So it's a contradiction. So the way out, the conclusion is that the algorithm to solve the holding problem cannot exist. Gödel's first incompleteness theorem constructs a sentence that says, I am unprovable. Russell's paradox is the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Does it contain itself? Yes, if and only if no. Tarski's theorem on the undefinability of truth is the same. You assume that there's a predicate that expresses truth for every true sentence and then feed it its own description and negate it. It's true if and only if it is false. And <clears throat> this diagonalization argument by Cantor that you probably saw during your studies or whenever is the same story. They are all the liar products. <laughs> Just very revealing for me to realize that these things that look so complicated and so different, they are instances of the same kind of paradox that we all thought about when we were kids. It's very far reaching too, because you cannot fix it. <laughs> so from any set, you can construct its power set that's gonna be more expressive than S. And then from here, you can apply, you know, construct the power set of the power set. It's gonna be more expressive than P of S. And from here, you can construct the power set of the power set of the power set of S, and it's gonna be more expressive. And this, this doesn't terminate. It, this doesn't stabilize. There's always more. Every, every system is liable to the attack of self-reference and negation. In fact, it cannot be fixed in a finite way. You can construct, people try to construct like hierarchies that um, add some expressive power, but not so much so that 
um, you cannot build this self-referential paradox. But then in order to recover the full expressive power, then they have to go to the next level of the hierarchy, again, carefully, not adding too much power and so on. But then they only recover the full expressive power in the limit. And a limit is not a physical thing, I believe. So I don't think that's a solution. And it can be made general and precise. Um, in particular, in the language of category theory by Lovier, there's a theorem from 69, which, which has been made very nicely accessible by Janowski in this really nice paper. And this has been strengthened. This has been strengthened by David Roberts, his Lovier's theorem. But unfortunately, this is all in the language of category theory. So I'm trying to learn category theory in order to understand, you know, really the reach of um, undecidability. What isn't clear in all of these statements is what is universality and what does it mean in all of <clears throat> this Lovier theorem, for example. I mean, he, Janowski's paper has the word universal in the title, but that's a different meaning of universality. So category theory is a promising um, framework to try to understand the reach of undecidability and hopefully also universality. Yeah, and if you're new to that, uh, I recommend this book, which I have enjoyed very much uh, by Janowski, and particularly his explanation of the liar paradox and, and all of that is super clear. Okay, so we're trying to understand the reach of universality and later on undecidability across disciplines. And as a first step, we are we have proposed to describe spin models as automatic. I should say, in fact, as formal languages. I'm being slightly sloppy here. In the title, not in the paper. And we found that. Um, Oh, and then we, so first we cast classical spin Hamiltonians as formal languages, and then we classify this language in the Chomsky hierarchy and thereby obtain a new complexity measure of Hamiltonians. And we obtain that 1D is easy, 2D and everything further is hard. There's a lot of work in now to be done in refining this classification. The difficulty here is that you don't need a condition on one graph. You need a condition on a family of graphs. So that's that's kind of the tricky part here. Maybe, maybe we could be using something called graph grammars or something like that, I'm not sure. Anyway, 0D is trivial. Interestingly, there is effectively 0D, which is easy as well. Um, beyond that, these are my principles. <laughs> uh, maybe Mark should say, and if you don't like them, I have others. Well, in this case, <laughs> um, these are my principles. So far, I kind of stick to my principles. Uh, universality everywhere. Essentially, every non-trivial system is universal. And essentially, every question about the system is undecidable. That's the other side of the coin. Um, I'm hoping to go into these crazier directions with Ricard Soule. I have this very... Um, I'm very lucky to, to kind of be able to work with him, who is such a knowledgeable person and so um, such, such a broad knowledge on so many different topics related to complex systems in its many facets. Um, and so we're trying to, yeah, go. I think we are a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of things we have to do. But uh, I, I hope that soon we will start to kind of pull out threads of, of all of this uh, collaboration. And we're thinking about this unified framework. And um, it's very open whether it, it should be possible to establish these correspondences at the quantum level. There's a notion of universality here for quantum spin models, quantum Turing machines, quantum machine learning. I don't know. I mean, this should be possible, but this is not going to happen at least where we are. I see this as something happening in a couple of years. And thank you. That's a picture of the group. Uh, Sebastian and Toby are working on these things. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Gemma. Uh, so yeah, clap, clap, clap. I, I was just looking for the clapping uh, emoji and I cannot find it right now. So <laughs> excellent. Um, thanks a lot for this very nice and intriguing and exotic talk. Um, yeah, it's time for questions from the from the audience. Questions, suggestions, provocations, uh, everything is accepted. Okay. Let's see. Gesa, Gesa has a question, of course. I... Gesa, all yours. Gesa. Oh, I have to allow you to speak, actually. Okay. Okay. Now you're going to speak, Gesa. Yeah. Okay. Hello. So <clears throat> thanks, Gemma, for the very nice talk. And, and thanks for coming over, if only virtually. I hope sometimes also uh, physically. Um, I have <clears throat> sort of two, two, two questions. One more technical, whether, and let me post them both, and then you can decide which one you want to answer. The, <clears throat> the one was uh, this mapping from spin systems to languages seems very particular. And is this the only thing one can think of? Or have you tried out others that were not so fruitful. And the other thing is, didn't you end with a very pessimistic stance, like essentially every question is undecidable. So um, is there essentially nothing to do in, in science then? <laughs> That's, I actually had the same question. <laughs> Thank you for your question. So let me start with the first one. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the map from classical spin models to formal languages is not unique mm -hmm. because, for example, it depends on how we encode the energy. We are currently encoding the energy in unary, which means that we have a single symbol, a diamond, mm -hmm. and we map the number 5 to 5 diamonds mm -hmm. and the number 21 to 21 diamonds. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in fact, we have another symbol for the negative numbers. So we map the number minus 102 to minus, sorry, to 102 copies of another symbol, like a square. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have shown that if we instead encode the energy in binary, then our complexity classification is modified by, I think the 1D spin models become context sensitive. So what this means that the complexity classification depends on, on, the, on how we have cast H as LH. Okay, morally, we would like, this is a complexity measure. So it would make sense to choose the LH whose complexity is minimal, right? Because we don't, wanna, we don't want the complexity to come from the encoding, but to come from H. And we have partially investigated this issue. For example, as I just said, if the energy is encoded in binary, then the, the complexity increases, which kind of supports the view that, or suggests that unary is better. But um, it also the, the complexity is also gonna depend on the ordering of the spins. For example, if this is a 1D spin system, but we order them in a crazy way, so that they are no, no longer like locally correlated, and that's going to increase the complexity in an artificial way. So I think, so what we need to do soon is to fully characterize the freedom of the map from H to LH. I think this is doable. However, the minimization in the image of this map is probably going to be not doable. It's probably going to be undecidable because this is very reminiscent to algorithmic information theory and of complexity and so on. I hope this answers your first, your first question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna to move to the second question. Well, the fact that essentially everything is undecidable, this is a, this is a fact, okay? It's a, you, can do it, you can see it by a counting argument. The set of functions from the naturals to zero one, which are computable, has the cardinality of the naturals, Aleph zero. But the set of such, all such functions has the cardinality of the reals, two to the Aleph zero. So essentially no function is computable. 
Another question is whether all of these functions are uncomputable functions are interesting or not. Well, clearly most of them are uninteresting, but some of them are interesting, like the halting problem, the matrix mortality problem, or the post correspondence problem. So they're natural questions, which are, I would claim are interesting and are undecidable. So I do think that undecidability is important. Um, and I think so, I also think that it is very much at the core of computer science and mathematics and not so much at the core of physics, but I believe that this project can end up proving something like that every non-trivial property of um, Hamiltonian, spin Hamiltonian is undecidable. Now, um, how pessimistic is that? I don't know. Um, there, uh, there was an essay last year in this uh, FQXI kind of essays about undecidability that, where I also shared my thoughts by Marcus Mueller from, from Vienna, Marcus P. Mueller, um, proposing a very optimistic view on undecidability. It kind of lets us choose uh, which world we want to live in, if we kind of we want to add one axiom or the opposite of the axiom. And um, this, this, or maybe let me express it a little bit differently. This open-endedness here of the power set. You can take it as a message also, I'm not sure if I should say full of hope, but in some sense, um, a message about the open-endedness of, of this procedure. I like to use the phrase the beginning of infinity, but um, I don't know, it's the way things are. I don't know if it's, if it's pessimistic or if it's not. I'm not sure if, if it's my role also to say that. So, so if I may, may reply, so I think part of the pessimism, I guess, is in the word essentially and every non-trivial property because you, that seems to say there is actually nothing that can be decided and what can be decided is, is, is trivial, but, but maybe uh, there are interesting uh, non-trivial non questions that, that can be decided, right? We, we, there is a whole... No, but look, uh, um, it, so here it says essentially every question. Mm -hmm. This is true by a counting argument. Right, so it, it kind of, the, it's a zero measure set of yeah. questions that can be decided, but yeah. uh, the, the whether, where the interesting questions are, and so maybe that's not the right measure to use. Uh, I completely I agree. Actually, uh, David Deitch has proposed the principle of optimism that says that if a, if a question is interesting, then it is solvable. Oh, okay. I but think the halting problem mm -hmm. sounds like an interesting question. Yes, to me. yes. <laughs> It seems over optimistic on the other hand. <laughs> yes, but okay. So, but, uh, but I, com I completely agree with you that the distribution of interesting questions is very non uniform. Okay. In particular, interesting things often mean an interesting thing has a finite description because we understand it, right? Or we can understand at least the question. Yep. And having a finite description is essentially the same as saying that it is computable because having a finite description is like having a grammar. I mean, some finite descript or some descriptions can be like non-constructed, like the halting machine. I can imagine if it existed, then I cannot really implement it. But I think this gives evidence in the direction that interesting questions are more heavily localized around computable questions. Mm -hmm. But um, but as I said, there are many problems that we'd like to solve which we cannot solve. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, it was more a provocation than it, it, it was not a disagreement, only a provocation. But yeah, no, thank I, you for I care a lot about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Sorry, I was silent. Okay, um, more questions or provocations? <laughs> you are undecided. <laughs> Let's see. Um, there's a there's a question on the on the chat by an anonymous attendee. Oh, that's true. So um, anonymous, uh, there is a lot of work done on applying category theory to natural languages and neural networks. Look at John Bias School of Applied Category Theory. They've been doing a lot of exciting work in the past few years. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you, I will. As I said, I'm slowly diving into category theory. Excellent. Um, yeah, coming back to undesirability and undesirability, Gemma, uh, what about computing ground states? Is that undesirable in general? I mean, you, I mean, everything is undecidable, no? According to your talk, but <laughs> but there are things that are more undecidable than others, no? So um, I'm um, thinking of, of typical condensed matter systems where we are trying to find, you know, the typical story, new phases of matter, topological order, and all that. So. Um, <clears throat> well, one has to phrase the question a, a little bit precisely in terms of a um, decision problem. So what one is promised, that when one, one, what one has to decide. But yeah, I mean, this undecidability of the spectral gap problem suggests that many of these things are going to be undecidable, but there are going to be like lots of nuances, um, like what's the dimension of your local spins. Um, and what, what I think is the most mm -hmm. important question is, and um, what is the importance? <laughs> of proving that a uh, problem is undecidable in physics, because uh, I think that the thermodynamic limit does not exist, but if you cut it, if you cut the problem to only look at a finite number of sizes, then nothing is undecidable. Um, Strictly speaking, it does not exist, it's true. So um, uh, we, we live in an approximation, no? So. Yeah, but I think it's a very curious approximation or a very funny way of defining an approximation because it's an approximation with respect to a non-existing thing. Yeah, it's to, like, mathemat to a mathematical concept. No? So, uh, yeah, I find this very weird. It's like when we talk about zero temperature, there's no such thing, or pure states, or, yeah. or a closed system. All these idealizations are... And very, very funny, I think, that we physicists solve exactly, can only solve exactly non-existing cases. And then we reach toward the real case in a very conceptually surprising kind of way, I'd say. Yeah, and this idability could be seen as a pitfall of, of this idealization. And what and what about what about um, understanding language itself? So, uh, what type of questions in in since we are talking about what languages and so on, and, and we've been discussing a lot about that. What type of questions there could be more, let's say, more undecidable? No, uh, I know that it depends a lot. I mean, people have absolutely no clue still what what language is about. Um, that's my feeling. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. What is your opinion about that? So, well, I think the grammar part of natural languages. I feel ready to kind of try to understand that, because moreover, these grammars are not particularly complicated in the Cham Chomsky hierarchy. It seems. Oh, by the way, there's something else called the universal grammar, which I think is also related to what we have been talking yeah. about, but in a, in a bit of a different way. Um, but the really mysterious part of natural languages is, I think, semantic and meaning. And addressing these questions, I think, requires to address the relation between thought and language and how a meaning, which is very, very hard to grasp and very mysterious and very outside the realm of formal theories or the usual maths and physics that I'm used to doing. I love it, but I find it uh, challenging. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's curious, so, yeah. okay. Excellent, more questions or comments? No. Okay, so let's thank uh, Gemma once again, uh, again, I cannot find the, the clapping. Uh, oh, there is another question, maybe? No, okay, this was already, this was already answered. Uh, excellent, so thanks a lot, Gemma. Okay, for this uh, very nice and, and refreshing seminar. It was a pleasure to have you here virtually around and uh, hopefully next time you come to the IPC.
okay? And, okay. Uh, and, and, yeah, and you come for a physical visit, okay? I hope you also come to, to India. Yeah, I should, I should, I should. Yeah, it's been a long time. So, um, yeah, excellent. Thanks also to everybody uh, that was attending. And, uh, and that's it. I wish you a nice day and also a very good and sunny weekend, okay? You too. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Bye.